I'm starting here with a picture of a paddle boat in the, on the river Mississippi, which is near the park where I go for walks with my dog. So it's a, it's a nice place to get some inspiration, as you may imagine. Uh, to begin with, in the United States, I guess it's uh, customary to uh, show uh, disclosures. And I want to mention specifically the Lupus Research Alliance, which made our initial studies possible, also receiving some uh, honoraria and so on. But uh, first, uh, let me focus on uh, clinical features of lupus. And you see here a black uh, uh, female who uh, in fact has the most uh, common uh, presentation of about one in 700 individuals. And this is, uh, uh, you probably know, but a very difficult disease to diagnose because many different organ systems might be involved in, in a given patient, including uh, the cardiovascular system, the skin, as we already discussed, uh, general features, digestive tract, importantly, the kidney functions, uh, glomerular nephritis, uh, filtering function of the kidneys, uh, various types of joint uh, inflammation, as well as uh, obviously the, the manifestations in the blood, as well as the nervous system. So the diagnosis sometimes in patients may take over a year before they find the right uh, individual or, or physician to identify it and start treating lupus. Uh, as you may also know, lupus reduces life expectancy in people who suffer it. It does affect females more often than males at the ratio of nine to one. And it can stri strike at any age. In fact, uh, juvenile uh, kids, uh, kids with lupus have, have sometimes even more severe disease than adults or, or people who get this disease in middle age. So in, in many cases, uh, it would be uh, reasonably argued that lupus manifestations reflect B cell functions, namely because B cells produce the autoantibodies to DNA, RNA, and nucleic acid complexes that are so common in lupus. They also concentrate dilute antigens and present them very efficiently to T cells, and they can secrete cytokines and stimulate immune responses. And therefore, it was uh, several, many people now for, for quite a while arguing that B-cell depletion would be a potential therapy for lupus. And um, in our case, we, uh, we are a lab that really studies the disease in a small furry creature, uh, which is uh, generally uh, two strains of mice, either the MRL-LPR strain or the NZBWF1 mice. Uh, which spontaneously develop lupus manifestations and autoantibodies to the major SLE autoantigens. And they share many of the features as you're seeing here, including their skin, the kidney function, the heart, uh, heart uh, functions in their blood, and, and even if you can measure it, cognitive defects in these small animals uh, resemble some of the manifestations of patients. So we were hoping that this would be a reasonable model to study potential therapies for, um, for lupus. Now, uh, it also was known for a number of years that there could be several types of targets, including interfering with the B-cell, T-cell interactions or directly attacking B-cells, or then also uh, targeting different cytokines that act on B-cells and in fact, uh, se several of these have been trialed, for example, antibodies that disrupt CD40, CD40 ligand interactions or directly attack B cells uh, with antibodies monoclonals to CD19 or CD20. As you already heard, rituximab was high on this list, but also antibodies to a growth factor called BAF or uh, cytokines such as IL-6. But for example, if you take the example of rituximab, it was with high anticipation and perhaps fanfare that it was trialed in, in three different clinical trials, but uh, each of those failed to meet uh, trial endpoints. And so several people uh, felt that this raises doubts about the efficacy of B-cell depletion therapy for lupus. 
Now, if you're using a monoclonal antibody, you need to realize that there is a number of uh, steps that this antibody would need to uh, carry out. First of all, I guess rituximab would need to bind to CD20 at a certain level and then at certain uh, receptor occupancies. Uh, but at the minute you inject it into patients, it of course has its own decay rate and, and clearance rate. And then I, uh, for this to be effective, you need another uh, factor, for example, a phagocyte that would need to interact through the FC receptor, or at least an NK cell that could kill the autoreactive B cell or perhaps complement itself. But each of these arrows indicates on and off rates. So um, you could imagine also that the uh, concentration of the antibody decreases as you get further away from the bloodstream into perhaps uh, less, uh, less accessible tissues such as the kidney or the bone marrow. Now, uh, as you have already known, of course, the title of this conference or symposium is on CAR T cells, and they have several advantages. First of all, it's a direct interaction with the cell to be killed, uh, but they also are able to uh, re um, reproduce in the, in the host cells. They're replicating, thus a living drug. They are migrating uh, throughout your body, um, including the central nervous system and other tissues. And as I said, their effect on target cells is direct and cytotoxic. So we decided uh, to use an approach uh, in which we would test this in a mouse model system. Uh, as you already know, um, they're anti-CD19 cars. And in fact, it's interesting that in the study that Dr. Amy Payne just uh, brilliantly presented, uh, they were using an anti-CD19 car as a negative control or as a comparison to the CAAR that they're used for desmoclane. In our case, we used the retroviral vector provided from Jim Kokenderfer at the NCI from the Steve Rosenberg lab. And interestingly, I'll come back to this uh, two out of the three items in the CD3 Zeta had actually mutations of tyrosine to phenylalanine, thus reducing their signaling capacity in vivo. Now, these uh, um, genes were delivered by retrovirus into activated splenic CD8 T cells before uh, expansion uh, for six days and injection into autoimmune mice. Uh, following this uh, CAR T cell administration, we were following up these mice through collecting blood and urine at uh, regular intervals, as well as fo following euthanasia, uh, examining several of the tissues from the treated mice. So uh, as we already pointed out in the Consal et al. study, uh, one of the obvious effects of the treatment was that the life expectancy of these mice was increased. Here in blue, we'll show you the car treated mice in, in the tan color are controls that received only CD8 T cells that were mock transduced. So uh, in B, you are seeing already that the uh, level of uh, proteinuria uh, strongly was decreased in treated mice, whereas it kept getting worse in the control mice. Also, it was quite obvious, uh, even on the uh, phys physical appearance of these mice, that they were doing better. Their skin lesions and, and tail necropsies and, and so on uh, were uh, much better uh, following the CAR-T administration. And as was already uh, mentioned and brought up in other talks, uh, the uh, autoantibodies that are typical of lupus, for example, anti-DNA IgG, antihistone IgG, and anticardiolipin IgG were decreased to, board, uh, to, to background levels. 
Now, following uh, euthanasia, we were also able to compare the tissues. So the, in the skin, we saw much less infiltrates of inflammatory cells, uh, much less, uh, therefore, also fibrotic changes, acanth acanthesis, and so on. Uh, in the kidneys, also by immunofluorescence, we could show that the glomeruli had the more normal appearance and much less immune complex deposits. And the pathologist could also score these uh, mice and, and obviously more than just three of these mice uh, in a blinded fashion and, and could confirm that, uh, that kidneys and skins looked quite different in the CAR treated mice. One other observation we made is that in the CAR uh, uh, treated kidneys versus the control kidneys, there were less lymphoid agar. And here you see a kidney of a diseased mouse where the purple, intense purple staining, even at this low magnification, indicates big clusters of um, lymphoids, uh, lymphoid aggregates, uh, B and or T cells. We can't tell at this point, but uh, these uh, cell infiltrates also were uh, quite uh, dramatically prevented or even um, uh, avoided. And, and reversed in the car treated in the car treated mice. Now uh, I hope this will also uh, be confirmed by looking at the uh, reverse transcription polymerase uh, data for various uh, genes that we were measuring both in the spleen and the kidney. And here I think I want you to focus on the kidneys in which uh, both uh, CD19 uh, expression was basically back to background levels, as well as any expression of uh, C kappa or C lambda, the IG light chains were very low, if, if not background level in these mice. Sorry, I, I had to use this. Uh, uh, sound effect to, for better uh, for better effect and maybe wake up some of the people in the audience. But at that point, I think the attention of the world's rheumatologists and uh, patients with autoimmune disease was squarely focused on the university hospital in Erlangen. Why? Because within very short time after our study was published, uh, the individuals present here in the audience, including Dimitrios, Andreas, and Fabian, had these remarkable and I would say um, transformative uh, publications that really pivoted and, and, and attracted the attention of everyone worldwide to the fabulous and fantastic success that they were able to achieve. And obviously under the guidance of their uh, PI, uh, Dr. Shett, whose I think conviction and courage are quite, quite apparent uh, in, in these studies we are discussing. So specifically in the Mackinson study, what was interesting as already pointed out is that disease manifestations were decreased to background levels. Uh, proteinuria dra uh, drastically and rapidly decreased to background levels. Uh, Anti-DNA antibodies were as well uh, drastically reduced complement recovered and even subjective feelings such as fatigue uh, <clears throat> drastically decreased. Uh, so clinical measures of lupus rapidly improved by the anti-CD19 CAR therapy. And uh, uh, one interesting uh, observation was that in patient four anti-RNP antibodies remained present. And uh, we were curious about that because um, it's possible that some of the antibodies, uh, even though they are autoantibodies are produced by plasma cells. And this diagram really shows you the various stages of B cell development uh, and specifically the 
cell types that are uh, expressing CD19. So in the bone marrow during development, already pro B cells uh, that are in the process of rearranging their immunoglobin receptors become CD19 positive. Then most of the cell types in the periphery, mainly mature and immature B cells are CD19 positive, including plasma blasts, which I think are quite important because they are the source of secreted IgG. And by this uh, logic, perhaps would be the cells most likely to produce the autoantibodies that we can see are decreased by treatment with anti-CD19. However, uh, plasma cells at the far right uh, stop or reduce expression of CD19. Therefore, these long-lived plasma cells perhaps um, escape control by CD19. And, and in fact, that seems to be the case because of the responses to vaccines that Dr. Shett already pointed out, in which antibodies to measles or tetanus uh, continue to be produced, presumably by these long-lived plasma cells. But we were curious to see whether in the bone marrow, actually, there's evidence already of the CD19 CAR T cell expression. So we did RT-PCR specifically from uh, mouse bone marrows. And here again, in the blue, uh, di uh, blue, blue color, you can see the expression in the treated mice. And as you expect the CD19 expression is uh, drastically reduced, but also interestingly, RAG1 and RAG2 expressing cells are quite a bit um, uh, lower. And this also is an exponential uh, or logarithmic scale. So at least a hundred fold less cells express RAG1 and RAG2. Now that is presumably because the treatment is eliminating already in the bone marrow cells that are attempting to rearrange their immunoglobin genes. Now, further in the blood, of course, all as far as we can tell, all the treated mice uh, receiving anti-CD19 CAR T cells do not express CD19. And this actually persists in our case for quite a long time. Now, um, as I mentioned, the, the long-lived plasma cells are also a target of interest. And so what we are observing here is that you can use a very old-fashioned test of uh, antibody binding, which is called the ANA test or test for detecting antinuclear antibodies. Prior to the CAR, we already see that most of these mice are making some sort of ANA, and then following a uh, disease course, these binding patterns become more intense. But what about the CAR T treated mice? And here we are seeing that about one in four CAR treated mice still continue to be ANA positive. In fact, the pattern quite reminiscent of uh, an anti-RNP binding, uh, so bind antibodies to ribonucleoproteins may in fact persist um, in about 25% of these CAR T treated mice. We were curious to also confirm this by a more sophisticated way using autoantigen microarrays, and you can see already here before CAR T cell treatment, there's quite a bit of antibody production and, and it's hum, somewhat heterogeneous in this group of mice, but without CAR, all of these uh, reactivities actually increase. And this could also be, uh, this result could also be explained by some networking between the autoantibodies. But in the CAR T treated mice, what we were able to observe is that actually some reactivities persist, um, even uh, following CAR T cell treatment. And these do seem to overlap with some ribonucleoprotein reactive specificities. And in fact, uh, you could see that the anti-RNP antibodies arose early on in these mice, 
as well as that some anti-RNP may escape CAR T cell uh, control, therefore perhaps indicating that they're made by long-lived plasma cells. So to address the issue of uh, short-lived versus long-lived plasma cells, we did a, a gating approach with SCA1 and CD138 positive uh, quadrant identifying plasma cell subset in general. And then in the control mice, you can see both short and long-lived plasma cell uh, populations, whereas in the CAR-T treated uh, mice, the, uh, the uh, short-lived plasma cells are essentially eliminated, whereas long-lived plasma cells are still uh, abundantly present. By the way, the same uh, result can also be seen in the splenic B cells, which also the spleen also houses some of the plasma cells in a mouse. So conclusions that parallel human SLEs that depletion of CD19 B cells reduced autoantibody levels, improved uh, presentation of disease in the, in the kidneys, uh, in, in, in the skin, as well as affecting the lifespans. And of course, in humans, we would hope that they extend lifespans, but uh, health in general seems to be quite excellent in the patients that were treated so far. Um, we also seem to agree between mice and humans that some antibodies, for example, anti-RNP may escape killing by the anti-CD19 CAR T cells. Um, also anti-CD19 CAR T cells can be administered even quite late in a progressive disease uh, after advanced high-grade proteinuria is established. Now, distinct from human SLE, as you already know from listening to the earlier talks, is that depletion of CD19 B cells is sustained for over one year in NCBW and MRLLPR mice. And to confirm that, we actually tested specifically persistence of CAR T cells. I already told you in the blood uh, there was no evidence of CD19 B cells even about 12 months after CAR T cell administration, but we did two additional experiments in which B cells that were labeled from a donor mouse with a fluorescent dye called CFSE were injected into the bloodstream of these mice to see that at any given time, these B cells still would be actively ex uh, removed or depleted as well as we transferred total CD8 T cells from a spleen of a mouse that was treated several months earlier into a naive recipient autoimmune mouse in order to see if they could still control the disease. So uh, we in fact show here that the CFSC labeled cells are clearly detectable in the control mice that do not have CAR T cells, but are very rapidly removed um, following injection into a CAR T treated mouse. There's uh, clearly uh, the anti-CD19 CAR T cells are effective in this case about seven months after the CAR T administration. And here the uh, T cell transfer experiment into naive cells. And you can also see that CD19 population is basically down to background levels. And there is somewhat of an increased CD3 population. And interestingly, the phenotype of these uh, T cells is shifting toward a central memory phenotype, as you can see on the right. So, um, this is then clearly a difference with uh, Mackinson, who very clearly identified uh, naive B cells as really rapidly repopulating the patient's bloodstream. And in fact, it seems to correlate with the uh, gradual decline of anti-CD19 CAR T cells that then allows the new repertoire to arise and hopefully, as we see at this point, uh, be free of any um, uh, detectable autoantibody levels. Um, in fact, maybe I think I heard earlier that there could have been uh, one example of a 
um, recurrence, but but uh, obviously that's not that's not yet published, and um, I'm sure will be will be carefully followed up uh, by the group in Erlangen. So, uh, what might be the reason for the differences? And I think uh, my favorite interpretation is that there's actually a, a known effect of the strength of signaling through CD3 zeta items and the CAR T persistence. And this goes back to actually quite um, you know a long time ago, maybe about 15 years ago, the uh, Steve Rosenberg lab observed that if you mutate the items in the CD3 zeta domain of a car, you get much better uh, persistence of these cells in vivo. And a very similar experiment was done by the Michel Sadelin uh, lab in New York, in which they mutated the tyrosines to phenylalanines. And as you can see with two out of the three items mutated, the uh, clearance of this uh, car, uh, uh, of these cancer cells in vivo was much more effective and much more uh, long-term than uh, with the wild type CD3 zeta. So I think it could be uh, attested, of course, in mice, whether this uh, persistence correlates also in the autoimmune system. In addition, I think some other questions one could ask in the mouse model, and I think they were already kind of mentioned and, and brought up by others, is can the preconditioning or the chemotherapy be replaced by another treatment or perhaps by a different type of uh, CAR T cells? We would like to know how long anti-CD19 CAR T cells need to be active in the patients. Is it right around 100 days, could it be a little bit less? Could it be a little bit more? Of course, these are highly important questions from the patient's point of view. And also alternative targets or CAR T cell strategies might be equally effective and may be worth trying out. Uh, again, the mouse is a willing uh, participant in these, in these studies. Now, I think as Dr. Payne pointed out initially, this is a huge number of patients, uh, about 7% uh, of the total world population suffer from one or another kind of autoimmune disease. And this is just a partial list, but many of the diseases you're familiar with are on this list and in fact have been already tested in clinical trials using rituximab with some uh, variable rate of success, but I think they provided they are uh, serious enough diseases and lack current adequate therapies may be uh, on the list of candidates to go after. And in terms of the um, the uh, uh, ways of going about eradicating uh, B cells or in fact antigen specific T cells. There's a number of approaches underway. Obviously Dr. Uh, Amy Payne uh, showed these wonderful stories of Desmoglane and, and Musk. So the uh, two antigens responsible for diseases like Pamphigus vulgaris and Myasthenia gravis but there's also ways to eliminate uh, antigen-specific T cells, as we have shown in a mouse model of collagen-induced arthritis, as well as in various uh, trials for lupus, which include CD19 and BCMA, as well as combination receptors, uh, have some rather promising uh, perspectives uh, going forward. Here's a picture of my lab as well as collaborators, uh, Rita Kansal was the first author in the science uh, translational medicine. R Lorraine Albritt is a virologist. Tony Marion is a mouse geneticist. And as I mentioned, Jim Kokenderfer at the NCI got us initially the constructs for the anti-CD19 car. Um, there's various people that have participated, including some medical students, uh, tech, postdoc, graduate student, etc., in our lab. 
but a special thanks and and really for the motivation to even say, okay, studying lupus mechanisms is fine for an academician, but how do you actually treat the disease? I think interacting with patients was really the motivation why we set off on this uh, translational route. And uh, uh, with that, uh, I thank you very much and, and I'm glad to, uh, to take any questions.